Okay, well, I appreciate uh, we've had people willing to stay around through the late afternoon, um, and all of you seem awake, so I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I was really struck, uh, Richard, I, I, I think Richard had to run out. Richard Freeman, the last panel, was making his comments about financial, no, he's still in back there, about financial innovation and how it's not all, you know, so good, and mentioned a couple examples. And I just want to quickly give my favorite example. I, I don't know if people have heard of dead peasant insurance policies. If, if anyone saw Michael Moore's film, uh, Capitalism, A Love Story, he talked about dead peasant insurance policies. And what these are is it's when a company, a big company like Walmart, buys insurance policies for its, its like frontline workers. So they're buying insurance policies for a, a retail clerk. And for the most part, they have no idea that the policy has been bought on them. And when, when the, if that person actually dies, the money just goes to Walmart. You know, so, so that's the idea of the dead peasant. It's not, you know, so, so Michael Moore presented this, and it's really perverse. And, you know, he just said, God, this is really perverse. They're buying policies that are, you know, they're, they're betting that their workers are going to die. Um, and it is very perverse, and it was kind of, you know, was, of course, perverse and amusing and an advanced historian is in his movie. But being an economist, I was really troubled by this. And, um, insurance companies aren't doing this for free. So what actually is going on here is actually much, much more sophisticated than that. What's going on? Why does Walmart buy insurance from, I don't know, Hartford, whoever it is, you know, these dead peasant policies? Hartford isn't giving Walmart money. What's going on here? Well, it's actually a tax scam. The whole point of it is Walmart can control the timing of their earnings because if they buy policies on 30,000 workers, they know roughly, you can look at actuarial tables, you know roughly when they're going to die, the expenditures are tax deductible in the year they make them, and then they collect the, the money, you know, roughly, you know, they know how many people are going to die each year. So this is actually a very ingenious product. You had some brilliant person on Wall Street, an innovator, who figured out how to scam the tax code, and both, you know, the insurer and Walmart can benefit. So that was, that, you know, that to my mind is great financial innovation. And, okay, so that, that's my two cents on it. We have three, four people on this panel here who actually do know about innovation. Um, we have Matthew Keller, who's a professor at Southern Methodist University, and he's the co-editor with Fred Block, who's done a great, great deal of work on innovation, of the state of innovation, the U.S. government's role in technology development. Um, we have uh, J. Eric Garr, who's a principal of Price Waterhouse Cooper, and probably uh, most relevant for, for this panel is that he was the general manager of the National Broadband Plan at, at the Federal Communications Commission. So he delivered the broadband plan to Congress last year. So obviously very important for innovation, I think, for, for many purposes that we look at. Um, then we'll have Kate Gordon talk, who's at the Center for American Progress and also is the co-director of the National Apollo Alliance. So when I think of green jobs, um, I think of Kate, Apollo Alliance. Uh, that's about as far as it goes. I should also mention, because I really love this, she previously had been a senior associate at the Center on Wisconsin Strategy. And the reason why I love that is the conventional acronym for Center on Wisconsin Strategy is, of course, COWS. Uh, <laughs> awesome. you got to give them credit. <laughs> it's all Joel. <laughs> and then we have Mark Doms, who's the chief economist at the Department of Commerce, who, who will conclude uh, with comments and then we'll have some time for questions. So, uh, Matthew? Uh, thanks, uh, Dean, first of all, for that introduction. Uh, I am Matthew Keller, um, and I am, uh, as uh, Dean mentioned, the co-editor, uh, along with Fred Block, of uh, there's been a pattern established of holding up publications that you can't actually read, but of State of Innovation, uh, the government's role, U.S. government's role in technology development. And in that book, um, we draw together a number of case studies um, and broader analyses of um, actual agencies involved in innovation, what's done well, what's not done well, different models um, through or of mechanisms through which innovation is pursued. Um, and um, uh, accordingly, I've been given the task of um, the simple task of laying out the nature and extent of the federal government's role in innovation, and I have 12 minutes to do that. Um, <laughs> so this, is, of course, is impossible to accomplish. So in the short time I have, I just want to um, uh, make uh, three relatively quick points. I'll come back to these. You don't have to read them quickly. Um, three relatively quick points um, drawn from arguments developed in the book um, and emphasize some of the perhaps neglected parts of the story of um, where government action um, matters a great deal um, to innovation outcomes. Um, and the first point um, that I want to make in that regard is simply to note that the government is already um, deeply and critically involved uh, in the innovation economy. And to give you a sense uh, of that uh, sort of argument or point and uh, picking up on 
one, uh, one thing that Richard Freeman said is that we don't have good indicators of innovation drawn out across these things, and many are done in case studies. But I want to draw your attention to two um, findings that are documented in the book. Um, the first one is that Fred Block and I um, tracked the winners of the R&D 100, which is a magazine that publishes based on juries of um, technologists that rate review to technologies and cutting edge technologies that are available for sale in the marketplace. And it assesses sort of the most cutting edge and advanced technologies and it gives awards to the hundred of them. Um, that over time, that in the 1970s, government involvement with these award winners was relatively modest, um, but it's increased since the 1980s. And that when we tracked these technologies in 2006, um, we found that fully 77 of 88 R&D 100 award winners had been supported by federal government initiatives. And that's taken several forms. Um, one is um, that many of these um, award winners have come from collaborations in which there is a government or a public university scientist involved in the teams developing the ideas in the first place. Um, another uh, percentage of those, about a quarter of them, involved um, funding usually for early stage technology developments that have been provided seed funds from government agencies and various agencies working across different technological fields. And um, one field um, that's been left out of uh, most of the R&D 100 awards, I realize you can't read this chart and the fine print, um, but they don't usually talk about ph pharmaceuticals. So there's a piece in the book by uh, Stephen Vallis, uh, Daniel Kleinman, and Dina Biscotti that tracks political involvement in biopharmaceutical industry. And what they found was of the blockbuster billion-selling drugs in the status for 2006, that 13 of the 15 <coughs> billion-selling blockbuster drugs um, have been supported in what they call a significant way um, by federal supports. And that usually involves um, early stage for drug development and discovery or um, help passing through clinical trials. And so again, it's just to suggest um, that the government's role is actually quite pervasive, and I want to talk about a couple of dimensions of that role and why it's become more prominent over the last several decades. Um, so the first most uh, sort of basic point um, is um, the, something that you all know, and that's that innovation strategies among private firms have strikingly um, changed over the last four decades. And today's innovation environment um, is typically characterized by networks um, of relationships in which small and large firms are collaborating with one another. They're collaborating with government scientists. They're collaborating with university scientists to push forward innovation frontiers. Um, and they're also um, typically outsourcing manufacturing to third-party suppliers, third-party manufacturers often overseas. And this um, trend toward decentralization um, has many important causes and consequences. The financialization of the firm is one we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, but I want to focus on a more immediate policy-centric aspect of this um, uh, dynamic. Um, and that is that a host of recent research um, has suggested that as high-tech innovation has become more complex, um, that developing innovative products um, tends to increasingly depend upon um, the ability to integrate ideas from different scientific and technological technical domains. Um, in other words, to get a faster microchip, you have to both have theoretical physics, advances in theoretical physics um, that push forward um, Moore's law and how we know to put the chips together. But you also have to have advances in manufacturing that translate the theoretical idea into an actual marketable product that actually works. Um, and so in sum, you need experts from multiple domains to come together to generate the sorts of sparks that often give rise to actual sellable products. Um, yet for any specific specific firm, capturing these cross-field synergies is incredibly challenging. And that, for instance, hiring experts from multiple scientific domains is expensive, it's managerially unwieldy, and firms cannot predict in advance um, which specific scientific or technical domains will actually be relevant to innovation in their field. Um, so who could have known, for instance, that the insulin pump um, would be invented when an endocrinologist from the University of New Mexico introduced himself um, to a weapons designer from the San National Laboratories who happened to have a diabetic daughter um, in addition to expertise in microelectronics um, at a charity event. Um, or um, as Andrew Hargaden has documented, um, that the billion dollar selling Reebok pump shoe um, would have arisen from a fortuitous connection in which a third party design firm happened to have a staff member who had just worked on an unrelated project um, on inflatable splints for serious medical uh, foot and leg injuries. Um, um, and the idea is that in this environment of fast 
pace change and uncertainty, um, that firms typically engage in collaborative endeavors um, that attempt to resolve collective act action problems um, that are inherent in training and skill formation. Um, and they're also compelled to constantly seek out um, new expertise and new partners if they want to remain um, innovative and successful innovators. Um, so that firms that fail in these um, sort of projects are often characterized by links with the wrong network partners. Um, they become isolated from new developments that they're unaware of. Um, they may be linked to untrustworthy or incompetent partners. And Andrew Schrank and Josh Whitford have called these um, uh, potential pitfalls network failures. And they've become more uh, common as firms have outsourced more elements of R&D and production to third parties. Um, this is precisely where government policies come in. And one of the key reasons why the US government role has become uh, increasingly salient over the last several decades, that US innovation programs have essentially been able to address at least modestly um, some of these network failures that have become endemic to decentralized production. Um, this has happened gradually. It's happened imperfectly. But since the 1980s, um, innovation policies have shifted away from more centralized flagship programs um, toward the operation of multiple, often uncoordinated agencies working to promote um, relatively discrete innovation outcomes. And today, there's a virtual alphabet soup of uh, federal agencies working to promote innovation. Um, just to take a few random examples, the Department of, of uh, Energy, which oversees the national laboratories, each and every national lab has programs that both invite private firms to take advantage of scientific knowledge developed inside the labs, and which um, allow entrepreneurial lab scientists to go into the private market and um, sort of exchange, uh, take a go at sort of commercial efforts. Um, the NSF operates uh, industry university uh, consortiums, which bring together public and private agents across domains to fo uh, focus on particular um, sorts of technological challenges. The NIST manages manufacturing extension partnerships to provide guidance to small manufacturing concerns that often lack experience or resources necessary um, to pursue su successful operations. Um, I could literally go on for hours um, that these examples barely scratch the surface, and I haven't even mentioned the two agencies with the largest R&D budgets, um, the NIH and the Department of Defense. Um, that this cornucopia of agencies um, does in many ways address um, what are classically known as market failures, um, like the well-known failures of private firms to invest in socially desirable or early stage technology ideas. Um, but they do much more. And when effective, these government efforts provide venues or fora in which enable the kinds of cross-cutting connections of technologists mentioned earlier. They open pathways to procurement opportunities. Um, they enable connections between entrepreneurs and networks of firms and financiers. Um, that they um, certify ideas and um, push forward uh, by using uh, sort of standards and procurement and so on. Um, and moreover, this decentralized network of agencies allows many ideas to bubble up from below. Um, industrial policy debates have typically been fixated on the idea of government picking winners. But this decentralized approach that actually typifies federal efforts, um, loosely coordinated agencies are often pursuing multiple overlapping pathways, which is precisely what tends to focus um, innovation that you don't know where the next great idea is going to come from. Um, and of course, um, not all ideas that bubble up are ultimately useful. Not all collaborative projects generate sparks. And the decentralization of the system can cause problems. Um, but the idea is that this decentralized system has created the sort of environment in which these collaborative synergies can frequently take place. The second and third points are very brief, and I want to sort of build on this discussion by um, suggesting um, both what some recent trends have been and also some possible small ways in which you might pursue or improve innovation policies. And the first is just to mention that until recently, um, the U.S. government's involvement in these decentralized networks has typically ended at the laboratory door. You create the collaboration, you seed the funding ideas, um, but then you leave the private sector to essentially determine which ideas are good and bad. Um, that since 2009, the Obama administration with stimulus funds has um, focused much more intently on also creating manufacturing capacity in key industries. And the logic of this is actually quite sound, and it speaks to one of the signal weaknesses of the U.S. innovation system. And that is we're very good at getting ideas to bubble up from below, um, but then um, foreign governments, um, competitors have often taken the initiative and established the actual factories, invested resources um, in the factories that actually build these um, 
products and services. This has happened in flat panel display where the discoveries were made here, but um, Asian, East Asian governments um, established factories to build them and production offshores. It's happened with solar panels where discoveries were made here, but production goes offshore. And the idea is that in these innovative networks, um, when manufacturing moves offshore, um, that you cut yourself off from a key sort of node in these collective networks, the expertise that people actually have and the uh, sort of practical know-how that's developed from actually building um, products and services. And I mention this um, because it leads to the third and final points, um, which is how might one improve upon these emergent strategies and long existing strategies. And I want to close with one general point and one sort of micro level point. Um, and first, the general point is that we already know that the U.S. government has a significant capacity to foster um, innovative outcomes. These networks exist um, that you can build on them. You don't have to start from scratch. Um, we don't need new, large, centrally managed um, innovation programs to spring up from the ground because um, essentially we already have networks in place um, and we can build upon the existing uh, infrastructure. And on a broader scale, this might include stronger policies to enhance support to manufacturing, which has long been neglected in these sort of seeding of networks. Um, this might include more funds for the manufacturing extension partnerships, which currently reach only a modest amount of the firms or the small firms that have been um, sort of the engine of growth in the U.S. economy. Um, the NIC could also expand its production capacity. Um, advanced manufacturing labs could help firms resolve production problems and office of supply chain management. Um, uh, could provide firms with information on supplies of lithium, polysilicon, and other inputs um, to the manufacturing process um, that are needed by multiple firms, thus smoothing um, the coordination and, inflow, and information flow among U.S. manufacturers. Um, a center for advanced manufacturing skills um, could help community colleges develop curricula that train uh, sort of students and potential workers in skills that are actually needed by factories. Um, that these, none of these ideas are novel. Um, they build upon but would consolidate capacities that are currently spread over many agencies across the federal government. Um, the last point picks up on this, and it also picks up uh, a point that Richard Freeman made um, earlier, which is um, that at a more, uh, a more micro level, um, we don't measure innovation in what agencies actually do well. And that um, this idea of what I've introduced of network failures is not everything. There are such things as market failures, and they are important in many ways. Um, but that extant innovation programs um, are evaluated primarily based upon market failure types of metrics and whether or not they satisfy um, or compensate for market failures. And that this um, sort of finally has several important dimensions. Um, first, um, since the performance metrics are typically premised upon a market failure model, um, programs receive little support and little credit for or doing the, making the sorts of connections, picking up a phone call and introducing an entrepreneur to a financier. They don't receive credit for that. And because they don't receive credit for it, we don't measure it, and it can't be built into program evaluations and ways of going about improving innovation policies. And finally, um, that the ideology of industrial and innovation policymaking is locked into this market-centric market failure model, um, and that many innovation policymakers um, simply don't understand or even uh, consider the idea that networks need to have these sorts of synergies. Um, to co they don't consider the importance of network failures at all. So again, that these are modest and simple points, um, that figuring out best practices and how to push forward innovation policies um, under a network production regime um, essentially requires that we understand what agencies do and how they do it. And unless we have the measurement tools calibrated to detect those particular patterns, um, it will be very difficult to push forward new and uh, sort of innovative, innovative innovation policies. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, I'd like to thank the, economic, the Center for Economic Policy Research, uh, Communication Workers of America, Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and Working Poor in Georgetown for having me here. Um, I found it curious that you invited someone like me to an event on uh, jobs and competitiveness. Um, I'm not an economist. Uh, I've probably created a few jobs in the business that I run. Uh, so I like jobs. I think they're important. Um, I've spent my career actually making technology that does things for companies and for people. Um, so I'm, that's where I've spent my career is actually uh, taking digital technology and putting it to use for different things. And I'm really here to speak a little bit about this document, uh, which I had the great pleasure uh, to write when I was at the Federal Communications Commission uh, a couple years ago. Um, so my role in life is to sort of 
retell this story uh, at times like this, which I'm, I'm happy to do now. Um, let me just kind of make a main point about how broadband uh, and technology, which is the world that I live in, uh, relates to jobs and competitiveness and all that. Um, you know, my own view, and consistent with what was in the broadband plan, is that broadband is a general purpose technology. It sort of bleeds into everything. Um, the tough part with general purpose technologies, it's hard to measure. Uh, and they become so ubiquitous, it's hard to sort of find them. <laughs> they kind of pop up in different places. Uh, I'll spare you all the historical analogies that people like me often make about printing presses and steam engines and things like that. So just suffice it to say that at this stage in the game, broadband is sort of this really important asset um, that allows us to do magical things. Um, and when you really think about when I Skype over this device, with my sister in London, my family back in Chicago, and relatives in Hong Kong, the, the actual physics that's going on um, and the processing that's going on is a minor miracle. I mean, it's really amazing what, uh, what this industry can do from a communication standpoint. Um, but it is sort of everywhere, and it's hard to actually touch it. So what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about that industry as it relates to the title of this event. Uh, since, again, I'm not necessarily an expert on these things, but let me, uh, let me tell you a little bit about them um, as they relate to the title, which I thought was long and ambitious. <laughs> um, so let me just kind of run through a couple of the key terms. Um, you know, jobs. So there are indirect jobs and direct jobs from broadband. Obviously, the network part of broadband, which is where I spend most of my time, is all about uh, wires <laughs> and towers and assets that are often owned by large companies uh, that often employ large numbers of workers to actually build the network that allows this magic to happen. Uh, those are very real jobs, and more network assets tends to mean more jobs. Uh, more investment by those companies in those networks tends to also mean more jobs. There's also a bunch of indirect jobs. I mean, I, I venture a guess that just about everybody in this room uses a computer network about every 10 minutes. Um, I mean, I can't imagine maybe a little less for some of you, but probably more than once an hour. Um, so in terms of you doing your job, uh, imagine how you could do it if you didn't have this ability and this magic to be able to connect to people truly anywhere around the world. I think that's an important distinction because as we think about the policy agenda, we need to, you know, at one level focus on sort of these important companies and the workers that work there and how we make sure that that industry continues to grow. But then we also got to realize that this affects uh, a huge chunk of the economy uh, around the world. And so, you know, we have sort of a responsibility to make sure that, uh, that the broadband ecosystem is, is, is healthy because it supports so many other things. Um, the next term in the title I, I was struck by is inequality. Um, and I appreciated the prior panel sort of saying, you know, now we can talk about inequality. We, <laughs> we didn't use that word for a while. Now maybe we use it. Um, this is probably the most important issue from my standpoint in broadband. The tough part about the broadband ecosystem is it's not evenly distributed. Okay, so looking around the audience, most people probably live here in the D.C. area. If they're not in the D.C. area, they traveled in from some other major city. And odds are you have pretty good access to both computing and broadband in your workplace and probably at home. Um, so we're, you know, we probably don't have to worry too much about us. The tough part is that only about two-thirds of Americans actually take broadband service in their home. And only about 90 percent of us, a little bit more than 90 percent, even have access to the facilities to deliver broadband. So there's definitely an inequality issue here where there's a certain part of the population who can't get it no matter how badly they want it. And then there's a pretty significant part of the population that chooses not to buy it. Um, now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Cost is a big reason, and that, again, is very much an inequality issue. Uh, if this technology is so magical and so useful, uh, is there a public interest to help others get on board with it? Um, but there's also digital literacy issues and relevance issues. Um, I've done some work in some developing countries, and. You know, I'll use a developing country analogy, but I think similar things occur in this country. And any of you who have wandered through places like this know that there are uh, computing labs littering the developing world that aren't relevant to the populations that live near the lab. 
Um, so, you know, having more Microsoft Excel licenses in a low-income neighborhood in Brazil doesn't really help anybody. Um, I mean, it's kind of nifty that you can, like, go get a spreadsheet. But uh, what often is missing is the relevance. You know, if you live in a low-income neighborhood in Brazil, which is the country I'm most familiar with, your issues are how do you get a job? How do you post your resume online? And that's not Excel. That's a different set of skills that need to go to make the technology a little more relevant. Um, the couple other points I'd make on the, uh, on the, again, wonderful title is role of government and competitiveness. So first in terms of role of government, uh, for better or for worse, the broadband industry, particularly the network portion, is primarily a private market activity in this country. Uh, there's a lot of schools of thought about could we do it a different way. Some countries have different traditions, but the reality is that's the situation we have here. Those companies invest a lot, uh, almost $40 billion a year in the capital improvement of the networks that deliver all the magic to us every day. Um, there is a government role here because we kind of regulate the terms and which at which they can do that work. So we regulate the airwaves, uh, which is spectrum policy. So how this actually works is over a, a, a set of frequencies that are given to a company by the FCC that are actually owned by the public. Um, and then that broadband is often delivered through holes dug in our communities <laughs> or towers put up in our communities. And local government often has a role in how those uh, infrastructure issues are worked out. Um, you know, particularly on the wireless side, uh, re realize that there's still a lot of wires involved <laughs> uh, when I do this wireless communication. It goes to a tower. That tower has to be connected to the backbone in certain ways. And there's a lot of work there that very much touches government and how government chooses to set rules around that public infrastructure is really important to allow these companies to do uh, to do what they do. Um, so what do we do about all this? What's the policy agenda? You know, if broadband is sort of this ubiquitous thing that uh, allows us to do great things, but there's some inequality present in the infrastructure, what's the policy agenda to try and, and close some of those gaps and improve the ecosystem? Um, and I'll give you just a quick highlight from the National Broadband Plan, um, you know, which if you go to broadband.gov, you can download it and read it. Um, there are really three areas uh, that, I, that we thought when we wrote the plan, and I believe still to be true, uh, that frame the agenda for the country to promote broadband. The first one is uh, innovation and investment, recognizing that this is fundamentally in this country a private sector activity, um, but that the government plays a role and that we need to do things to make deployment lower cost so that deployment, that we have more deployment. And that essentially means more jobs. That's more networks being put in certain places. Um, there's also a really important role that the government t plays in research and development. It's really important to remember that the, a lot of the science that allows us to do all the things that these devices do started by government-funded research in the 50s and the 60s. Um, we are, this industry is absolutely the benefit, uh, no matter what anyone will tell you, of really good R&D funding at this, in this country, you know, after World War II. And that gives us the science to do a lot of these things. That needs to continue. Uh, that type of basic research and development is really, really important. Um, the second part of the policy agenda is all about inclusion. Um, so even though this is a private market activity in a lot of cases in this country, there are places where it's not working so well, and there's definitely a role for government action. And I think probably the most, two most important places for that are one is around universal service reform, which is kind of, if you're not in the telco industry, you probably don't hear much about this sort of thing. But there's a, a fund that the FCC administers that basically uh, subsidizes phone service into rural areas. Took 30 or 40 years to get phone service just about everywhere. That program needs to be tuned for broadband. And if you follow what's going on at the FCC these days, they're well on their way to making some changes to that program to point it more towards some modern technologies, which I think is really good. That provides capital funding to make sure that the network gets distributed more widely. Um, and then uh, the second important part about inclusion is adoption efforts. Uh, and if you look at what the NTIA did over the last couple of years, and as well as what I think the FCC is announcing tomorrow with a big adoption program, partnering up with a bunch of companies that are going to help with this, helping Americans get online, uh, providing them digital literacy training, uh, and where appropriate, access to low-cost uh, access or low-cost computing is a really important part of that inclusion thing. Um, and then the third part of the policy agenda is the government also needs to use broadband. 
Um, we need to use it to make government cheaper, more effective, uh, better serving citizens. And there's a whole section of the plan on various national purposes, whether it's health care, public safety, et cetera, where broadband uh, can really make a material difference. Um, so I guess my final comment before we move on, again, to come back to the theme of the conference, um, in many ways, uh, you know, we're the plumbers, people like me. You know, we kind of figure out ways to get all this stuff connected, and we figure out ways to build machines that allow all these things to happen. Um, that has a huge impact on jobs, uh, both directly for people that actually install towers or dig trenches for wires, as well as scientists that write software or companies that you know, make uh, digital media. Um, so there's a huge, huge jobs component directly from this industry. And then when you think about how most of the professional work in the world gets done today, it certainly has a secondary impact just about everywhere. Uh, the point I'd close on, though, is about competitiveness. And this is probably the two issues that I'd, I'd kind of leave you with, uh, one on the wireless side and one on the wired side. Uh, from a wireless standpoint, there was a marvelous article in The Economist uh, just this week looking at our uh, smartphone adoption versus several other countries. It was a very interesting uh, moment in time where uh, 10 years ago, Europe had the hot phones. Everybody wanted a Nokia phone. You know, that was like the hot handset. Well, that's different. Um, everybody wants an iPhone or a Droid phone. Um, now, funny thing about the iPhone and the Droid phone is that the number of jobs that create those things are spread all over God's creation. So there is work done in this country. There is work done in a whole bunch of countries. Those are really global phone platforms, even though uh, they have some U.S. Uh, companies that sort of lead the charge on them. Um, but that creates an interesting opportunity where if you look at the wireless industry in the U.S., I think it's, it's taking a leadership role in a way that maybe it didn't, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago when our European friends were really driving innovation. Um, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, and I think the more we do in this country to uh, promote the networks that support those devices is really important. I think the biggest problem in this country is if too many of us get these all at once and we try to use them all at once, it causes a lot of problem for the poor infrastructure companies that have to hold them together, which means they need to do more uh, investing to make those networks uh, uh, secure and, and able to support what we need. And then the, the, the story on the wired side, this is the one where we probably have a little bit more work to do. You know, right now, if you go to Korea or uh, Hong Kong, you can buy really fast wired broadband into your house. Now, the funny thing is nobody really buys it. <laughs> So it's sort of, it's available. Um, and my own view is that those countries don't yet have the other parts of the ecosystem that can make the devices, design the applications that can use all that broadband. We're actually pretty good at the design part of the ecosystem. Um, but we should all be a little worried that we don't have enough high-end uh, markets in this country. There's a fascinating effort being driven by our university communities right now called gig.u. If you go to gig-u.org, uh, uh, basically, 37 of our leading research institutions have basically banded together and said, look, we want to find a way to create a market for next generation broadband in our university communities. Um, because from a competitiveness standpoint and from an innovation standpoint, that's where most of our goodies get invented. Even if they're not invented there, they germinate there. Uh, if you look back at Google and Facebook and Napster, which I know had some legal issues, but, you know, still peer-to-peer -peer things like Napster, uh, many of these things germinated at our big universities. So making sure that their infrastructure is truly world-leading, um, and if these universities are successful in partnering up with the communications companies to do that, I think that's a really important thing to keep us competitive so that we don't lose that design edge, um, so that we do make sure that the next, the next person kind of sitting in a dorm room thinking up a new idea is sitting in this country uh, and so that those products and services are developed here. Anyway, thanks again for having me. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me. And I was happy, I was I have to say, to hear Matt quote Josh Whitford, who is another COWS alum. So we are taking over the world slowly, <laughs> uh, but surely. Um, so I, I want to talk about the relationship between innovation and competitiveness and clean energy. It's become a little bit of a political third rail to talk about clean energy, which is amazing to me. So we'll start by talking about why it's still important to talk about clean energy as part of innovation and competitiveness. Um, besides the fact that most of the public support clean energy investments and most of the business community does, it doesn't seem to have influenced Washington where clean energy is, is now, you know, sort of a dirty word. Um, 
which is scary, scary to me. So when we talk about the clean energy economy, just want to make clear that we're really talking about sort of the whole value chain of everything from invention and commercialization to production to installation to operations and maintenance. We're really talking about sort of how we generate energy, how we use energy, how we produce energy, how we export technologies that have anything to do with energy. It really does underlie every single activity in our economy. It's a, a very, very broad set of activities um, and a broad set of, of jobs. And I think that's important because it's hard to talk about sort of the clean energy sector as a thing. But we do like to talk about the transition to cleaner energy economy as a thing because it's a way of thinking about how we want to see America, basically, and how we want to generate uh, low-carbon electricity and fuels. Um, this is, you know, kind of the job span all kinds of different industries, renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency, clean transit, um, wastewater treatment organic farming. There's just a huge, huge number of, of places that you can look at. People talking about these sectors tend to talk about renewable energy and energy efficiency because they're the easiest ones to quantify um, and talk about. And we know that there's a lot of jobs in these sectors right now. The Brookings Institution just came out with a report a couple months ago that I recommend called Sizing the Clean Energy Economy, which shows that we today, with current policies, have about 2.7 million jobs in clean energy sectors. That's broadly defined and includes transit and wastewater treatment and conservation. So 2.7 million jobs today that between 2003 and 2010, which were not the best years for the American economy, we saw growth in clean energy technology sectors, particularly in wind and solar, um, at a rate of more than two times the growth of the economy as a whole. So this is a bright spot in our economy, um, contrary to what you might be reading. And uh, in, in some sectors in particular, solar thermal, 18.5% growth in those years, for instance. Um, and also, we are surprisingly a net exporter of many of these components. We're a net exporter of solar components, for instance. We export to China. We have a positive trade balance with China when it comes to solar components. Surprises a lot of people. Um, and the reason for that is in a good part because of our innovative edge in a lot of these technologies. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Importantly to the uh, equity part of this conversation, these are jobs across a number of occupations and a number of sectors. And the Brookings report shows some things that I think are really important, that over a quarter of these jobs are in manufacturing, an important point, mostly in advanced manufacturing, that nearly half of the jobs in these clean energy sectors are jobs that are available to people without a four-year college degree. So that's, as you all probably know better than I even, that's about 70% of our workforce doesn't have a four-year college degree. And that they pay on average about 13% more than jobs in the economy as a whole. So that's important. You know, there's a, a range of jobs, a range of occupations, a range of types of industries and pretty decent jobs um, in manufacturing. There's a very, very strong relationship between the clean energy economy and innovation and competitiveness for a bunch of reasons. First of all, this is an enormously growing uh, interest in the world. Um, we are facing resource constraints, in particular in water and food, but also in energy, especially as developing countries like China and India, and India gear up, and Brazil. We have a number of countries that have imposed costs on carbon. We're not one of them, of course, but we have a number that have. Um, and we have growing energy demands, again, in some of these developing countries. Those things combined, resource constraints, Costs on carbon, growing energy demands mean that there is an enormous market for these technologies globally. So the, this creates a lot of demand for products, a lot of room for innovation, a lot of sort of market for innovation. Um, we also need to constantly bring down the cost of competing with fossil fuels. Uh, the cost of energy inputs is one of the biggest costs of most industries. So if you do manufacturing, for instance, this is one of your biggest costs. Bringing down those costs requires innovation, makes us more competitive. Traditionally, the U.S. has been a driver of innovative solutions on energy, and uh, to, to Matt's point earlier, many of those have come out of the public sector. Um, the solar panel was invented by NASA, for instance, uh, as in, in part of the space program. Thin film, film solar was a U.S. invention that really came out of the labs, the national labs and universities. We are most recently leaders in electric drivetrains and electric batteries. A lot of that comes from uh, investments through the Recovery Act. Um, so there's been a big public sector role, whether through R&D, through labs and universities, through commercialization grants, um, and also through procurement. The, the government has been a big procurer of clean energy, which has really driven demand in, uh, in this space. So that's important. 
But we have a serious lack of policy consistency uh, in this area and a lack of programs um, that really support a transition, a whole scale transition to a clean energy economy and therefore have a strong risk of falling behind other countries here. I can hold up my own report now. Uh, <laughs> yay, I have a report. Um, we did this report uh, rising to the challenge about looking at how China is dealing with uh, innovation and competitiveness and, and looking at what the U.S. can learn from that. And I, I realized after we published this that I, I think I didn't choose this picture, but I have this terrible feeling that they're making something really low-tech, like cathode rays or something. And so I, they're <laughs> supposed to be a high an advanced technology picture, and it's not, but just pretend it is. Um, uh, it's, I have extra copies of this, by the way, with me. Um, Rising to the Challenge, it's called, uh, a progressive U.S. approach to China innovation and competitiveness policies. And what we say in this report is really like that the public discussion about China in this country has increasingly sort of focused on the ways in which China is cheating. So there's sort of this rhetoric of if only China would stop cheating, the U.S. would regain our natural place as the innovation leaders of the world, right? And I think there is certainly areas in which China is cheating. I mean, I'm not saying that's not true, but to think that we have a natural and inherent leadership in innovation when we are systematically undermining our own building blocks of innovation is just crazy. So what China's doing, and it's very instructive, is taking an integrated approach on clean energy that looks at demand, helping create demand for products, helping build up through financing and other mechanisms the manufacturing and, uh, and technology support for innovation and production. And they're also um, helping, they're basically having huge, a huge focus on export. So they have an economic development strategy around clean energy that's extremely integrated. And you can see this in their 12th five-year plan that just came out. Clean energy is a major platform. In their 12th five-year plan, China has decided to become a world leader in clean energy, not only because of its own energy constraints, but because it wants, it sees places to sell into in the rest of the market. Uh, that's really a critical insight of, of the Chinese. And they've also realized a couple other things, that there's a strong relationship between manufacturing and innovation, so that co-locating manufacturing, advanced manufacturing and engineering and research and development centers is important to kind of uh, the first generation of technologies, but even more so the next successive generations of technologies. Um, which is one reason that uh, Applied Materials, for instance, a U.S. company has located its largest R&D facility in China. Um, they'll, they'll tell you it's for a couple reasons. Number one, close to the supply chain. And number two, that China is investing, again, in an integrated approach in these universities that are graduating enormous numbers of two-year engineers, two-year engineering degree students, about the skill level that you need to be doing the advanced manufacturing and have, a, and, and have the skills to talk to the engineers. So, so this is important integrated approach. The EU, if you don't like the sort of top-down China method, the EU has a similar approach. The European Union has a 2020-20 policy, 20% 20 of its power from renewable sources by 2020, 20% more efficiency, and 20% lower carbon emissions. That policy is, is put into effect in different ways in every EU country, but it's important in that it drives overall innovation and overall competitiveness. I think it's absolutely true what my pan fellow panelists have said and others have said about the lack of indicators on innovation, but I will say that one thing I find interesting is that if you look at the, the Kyoto signatories, the signatories to the Kyoto Accord, of which we are not one, uh, their patents in clean energy technologies have increased by threefold since signing Kyoto, whereas our and in Australia, the two non-signers that are developed countries, our patents have remained at about the same level. So they are, in fact, seeing a drive toward innovation from signing Kyoto and having that sort of recognition that this is the way those countries are going. U.S., in, in contrast, has a set of policies that are very intermittent, that are very politicized. Um, our largest policies on clean energy that we've ever had come from the Recovery Act, the single largest domestic clean energy bill in this country's history, which is ending. Um, we have two-year, primarily two-year extensions on our tax credits for clean energy technologies. We have an enormous political machine working against clean energy right now. You'll see it every day. Today, the Wall Street Journal had yet another article about how green jobs don't exist and how we're paying millions of public sector dollars for every green job. Um, so we have this inter intermittent and uh, inconsistent approach that has led us to a couple of important things. It's led us to really only investing in a consistent way in very early stage R&D 
and a little bit in installation. And I think that's important in the equity conversation. The early stage R&D is great. It doesn't create all that many jobs. They're high skilled jobs and it doesn't guarantee the commercialization and production happens here. The installation jobs are great, but they're temporary and they tend to be low skill. And there aren't that many of them if you don't have a consistent policy in place to drive installation of renewable energy and efficiency. So, um, and I, you know, what you get is this sort of hollowing out of the middle, right? You don't get the commercialization, you don't get the manufacturing, you don't get the sort of things at scale. Um, and even those policies, even early stage R&D is under attack in the current budget debates. Uh, the last CR that we saw from the Republicans in the House uh, took away all of the R&D programs from the Department of Energy that focused on anything other than fossil fuels. So we are seeing just a ho an undermining of this whole area. So we would say at Center for American Progress, we sort of have a three-part strategy for how to address this. We always say you need demand, so you need help drive demand for these products through a clean energy standard, for instance, that sets a, a, a percentage of, of our, our energy that comes from renewable sources. You need consistent financing through something like a green bank. Um, uh, and you need infrastructure like broadband um, and also human capital infrastructure to underpin all of these programs. Obviously, we need a price on carbon is the single most important thing uh, that we need to drive all three of these things. Um, it, it, that's not going to happen in the short term. I mean, I'm not crazy. You know, none of this is going to happen in the short term. Um, <laughs> we're lucky if we can save, you know, the manufacturing extension partnership, honestly, in the short term. We're lucky if we can save, you know, any support to the federal labs in the short term. <laughs> um, so in the short term, I think what we need to do is really look at state and local activities. There's a lot going on at the state and local level. Environment America came out with a report this morning that I spoke about this morning, actually, that looks at those state and level local actions uh, and how they add up to pretty good emissions reductions and pretty good policies. Uh, we need to look at places like the Department of Defense. I absolutely agree they are a place to work with right now um, on building, especially building uh, uh, support for demand through procurement. We need to be building power we need to be looking at the state and local stuff, figuring out where it works, getting businesses to talk to the legislators directly, getting CEO to member contact, contact, making clear that this is actually happening across the country and it's not political, that it's a, it is a job growth strategy. My favorite story on that is always that Ohio Governor Kasich ran on a platform of getting rid of the state's renewable energy, energy standard. A bunch of Toledo businessmen came up to meet with them and they said, are you insane? This is the only growing industry in the state of Ohio. Do you really want to get rid of it? <laughs> you know, Toledo is a solar hub. You, you really want to stop this? And he said, oh yeah, hmm, right. I, I realized that was kind of dumb and he, he retracted. We need to be doing that over and over and over and over again. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have a, a natural progression and, and you see this, um, McKinsey did a great report with Google and I'll sum up on this that looks at innovation and breakthroughs in clean energy. And what they found is business as usual, if you do nothing, what you get, if you do nothing in the current political environment with the current power where it is, what you get is basically on the fuel side, a strategy to drill more. And on the electricity side, a strategy where natural gas becomes the answer. And you get drilling and natural gas, and whatever you think about that is sort of a, an environmental strategy, which we could say a lot about. What, the, what that does is to crowd out renewable energy and crowd out innovation and breakthrough. What that does is basically put you back on a path where you're using existing technologies. They're pretty lo low labor intensity. There's a lot of extraction, and it doesn't put the United States anywhere near on a path toward long-term competition, not to mention uh, emissions reduction and... Uh, and equality. So it's not looking good with business as usual. I do think that there's a lot we can do to build power um, toward a better set of solutions, but it's, uh, it's not going to happen here, um, but, but, but it's critically important. So thank you. Thanks, Kate. At least, at least you didn't try to tell us that global warming is real. <laughs> 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 it's cows, you know. <laughs> hey, er, thanks everybody for, for staying here so late. Uh, I first just want to say um, thanks to, to Larry Cohen and Abby Joseph Cohen. These are from this Innovation Advisory Board. 
and most of you probably don't know what it means. Basically what it means is we just suck up their time for free. And we have them come to meetings, both here in D.C., out in Colorado. We make them pay for their own lunch. We make them pay for their own flights. It's just um, so, you know, big shout out to you guys. And then uh, various members of the advisory board um, have meetings like this. So people like me can sit here and listen to all the great things that you all have to say. So, um, and I also want to thank the organizers of the conference. For those of you who have organized conferences, this is an incredibly thankless task, so thank you. Um, so, uh, I was asked to just comment briefly upon the, the, the three presentations here. So, I put, to the, put together these slides ahead of time, and let's see how well I guessed on what they were going to say. <laughs> um, the good news here is mu mu much like uh, a lot of things uh, I've heard today, you know, we're pretty much the administration is pretty much on board with this. Um, let me talk about the talk about uh, wage inequality, and it was a hot topic earlier today. You know, so there's wage inequality, and then we have a jobless problem as well. And another source of angst with the public um, that has to do with innovation and globalization is also job security. So whether the what whatever the data say, I think a lot of people today feel that their jobs aren't as secure as they were, you know, years ago, and. Um, the question is, you know, as, a, as an administration, how do we address that? I won't go into that in much detail, but um, that's something also to, to, to keep in mind. So let me just go real quickly through the, the three uh, presentations, excellent presentations you just heard by Matt, Eric, and Kate. And so when it comes to the U.S. government's role in innovation, you know, we pretty much agree with pretty much everything that, that, that Matt said, and there's not a whole lot to say. Um, there. Let me show you a, just a chart or two. And so this is how much money our society spends on research and development um, as a share of GDP. And that little green line is the federal share. And you'll notice that it kind of bumped up a lot uh, when we tried to put a man on the moon back in the 1960s. And it's kind of pretty much ticked down si since then. So, you know, when we're talking about federal support of research that Matt was talking about, you know, lots of great things have come from this. And from society's point of view, you know, we're not talking a lot of money. Um, now, a good chunk of that federal R&D money is DOD, okay? So that's just the way it is. Um, but let's look outside of DOD over time. And what we see is that, you know, there has been a pretty big increase in how much the federal government's actually spending in terms of dollars on R&D. But most of that increase is in the life sciences. The, you know, that's NIH. So various administrations have been pretty supportive of this. But um, if you go through and you look at all the great inventions that people have been talking about today, um, a lot of those are outside of the health sciences. And so one thing that we're really fearful of going forward is that although all these other investments in various fields of science have proven to be very wise use of public money in the past, that in the current budget environment that these things are going to be under attack. Um, and so basically what we're doing is when we cut back on this research funding, we're not shooting, we're, we're really hurting our ability to compete in the future. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, moving on to broadband. <clears throat> so why can't I talk about broadband? Why I can't talk about broadband is we're going to be issuing a report based on the most recent data on broadband availability, and we'll be issuing that later this month. I can't tell you the exact numbers or else people get mad at me. Um, but what I can tell you, though, is, you know, when people look at all these data about who has broadband and who doesn't, they look at urban, rural, they look at how it varies by income, they look at it by race and ethnicity, so on and so forth. Basically, all the disparities that we, that we know still exist. Um, and what I find really surprising about all these data that have come out over the years about broadband um, access and broadband usage is that these disparities are actually pretty persistent over time. And so it will be surprising if the most recent data show any difference in that trend. So all the points that Eric was talking about um, you know, are, are very pertinent and hold, tr hold true. What will be interesting about this data set versus a lot of others that we've seen before is it goes into the affordability issue. And it's the affordability of not just, you know, what's the affordability of the service of broadband, but also for a lot of people access broadband through a computer. For a lot of households, and we've been talking a lot about what's happening to the income distribution, you know, for a lot of households, a computer is pretty expensive. And so how can we talk about broadband access in this country if we don't also talk about all the cost of the things that it takes required to hook up to that broadband? So October 26th. Um, so I don't have a copy of the report to, to show. <laughs> but come to my office on Office 26. I'll give you a free one. Um, well, we give them away for free anyway. <laughs> um, so now let's talk about uh, clean energy. And my main comment here has to do with one of marketing. 
So we can talk about clean energy. And um, so we're on board with this. And as Kate mentioned, you know, the administration put its, the, put its money where its mouth is on, on this issue, at least with the Recovery Act. And we're having a hard time selling it. And in part, I think that's because um, I think there's a big segment of the population out there. When you talk about clean energy, they immediately just kind of turn you off. So when I think about energy, I try to think about it in terms of dollars and cents. So this is a marketing suggestion, and it might suck, but hey, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. So the, 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 the suggestion is the following. The petroleum, our deficit in petroleum-related products this year will likely be over, well, over $300 billion. And when you say that, and you say about how many millions of barrels of oil we pour today, I think most people's eyes kind of glaze over, right? So, you know, the price of oil has gone up this year relative to last year. That's why the deficit is going up. What's really surprising, if you look at actually how much oil we consume year to year, it actually doesn't change that much. We're actually, to use the, uh, the economic stories, it's very inelastic. It changes by a couple percentage points, but like the price of oil doubles, we reduce our consumption by about 2%. It's actually remarkable. So here we are as a country, we're sucking up over, we're sending over $300 billion this year overseas to support our oil habit. That's just, I, I think that's a big number. But what does $300 billion mean, especially when we were talking about this budget stuff where, you know, trillions comes into figures? So what I like to do is I like to put this into other figures. So let's put this into a per-person basis, per capita. So if you think about this per person, this year, each person in this country, on average, will be shipping $1,000 overseas just to support our oil habit. That's a really big number. And I think the Wall Street Journal might have a slightly different attitude if we started putting it into this kind of context. So that's $1,000 per person. In 2008, remember when oil prices spiked up, it was about $1,200 per person. So, you know, oil prices are really volatile now. They think it's like $85, $86 a barrel the last I looked. So it could even be higher than the numbers that we're projecting here. So we're just extrapolating the first seven months here. So that's a really big number. If we think about this in a per household basis, given that there's a little over, you know, over two and a half people per household. Now we're talking about $3,000 per household. So I think if a lot of people knew just how much money we were spending on foreign oil, forget the, the clean part and the global warming part just because of the wrecked perries in the world. But I just think from a very selfish point of view, there's a lot more people who would be open to the suggestion of government spending some money on alternative energies. If those alternative energies tend to be, you know, less carbon, that's, that's all and good. But I think that the, from a marketing point of view, that there's a lot of people who could be swayed just by the magnitudes of these numbers. So with that, I'll conclude. And just uh, thanks again to everybody. And uh, if you have any comments on anything, that's me. <laughs> hey, great. Thanks a lot, Mark. <clears throat> Well, we have, we have a few minutes for questions. I do just want to point out, just following up on the marketing, not that I, I will compete here with marketing with uh, Mark, but uh, just um, some of you may have caught the Washington Post this morning, a front page article, and they picked up on something that like I've been screaming about for probably as long as I've been in Washington longer, that the, the industry, and they, they focused on the oil industry, but it's not obviously not exclusive to the oil industry, but they're, they're in the habit of just basically making up numbers about how many jobs will be created. <laughs> And I was really delighted to see that, you know, you had the Washington Post just go, where do you get these numbers? And basically the conclusion was they just make them up. But, but I think it is very important because we could talk about jobs in clean energy, alternative energy, whatever it might be, whatever, whatever the best term is to use there. But if people think that, you know, we're going to have the oil pipeline from Canada and that's going to create 2 million jobs, that's pretty hard to say no to. Um, so I think it is really, it was, it, it was great, great to article. see that article. I just hope uh, they have their reporters and editors focus on that next time they get a number from the industry. So, okay, questions from the audience? First of all, I want to, oh, Debbie Goldman with CWA. I want to thank all of you. This was really a tremendous um, smorgasbord of uh, the role of government in stimulating competitiveness, innovation, and, and good jobs. Um, I also want to just take a moment to thank the folks who did all the behind-the-scenes work to uh, make this happen. And it's really quite a lot of work, particularly when you have moving targets of people from administration who all of a sudden the president says, you've got to be in Pittsburgh, you can't be at this event. So Nicole, will please stand up, Nicole. She did, uh, is from... Hey. 
our wonderful partner, the Center on, Econo uh, Center on Economic and Policy Research. And Dean, thank you very much for making Nicole's time available to do so much of the work. And also from the Kalmanovitz Initiative, Jennifer, uh, Katie Corrigan, who's been our MC for the day, did an enormous amount of work. And Jennifer, where's Jennifer? In the back. So thank you all very much. Um, and CWA, of course, was very pleased to be able to partner with both these organizations. I think it was an interesting combination bringing us all together. Um, my boss is sitting in the back still, and he will get angry at me if I don't mention something about broadband. So Eric, thank you very much for being here, promoting the broadband initiative. And as you know, CWA, as the largest union of communication workers, was very, very um, involved in not only the development of the plan, but actually years before the plan uh, began to be developed, uh, it was Larry Cohn's leadership that said, the rest of the world is way ahead of us in this critical 21st century infrastructure, and we need to address not only the gaps of rural, urban, and uh, rich and poor, and the ethnicity gaps and the affordability. Mm -hmm. We also have to address the fact that our networks, even people who have access to broadband, the quality of our networks are so far inferior to those that you encounter, either wired or wireless overseed. And um, we thought that this was going to be an unfortunate promotion of maybe some kind of illegal substance when he named our campaign the Speed Matters campaign. <laughs> but in fact, it caught on. Yeah, it's a and, great title. And um, my colleague here, Ken Perez, was one of the first to write a report that said, before you do anything, you have to have a national policy. We don't have a national policy. And we were very pleased that uh, the FCC undertook the, um, and actually it was legislation passed in the Recovery Act that mandated the development of the report. Um, but I want to tie that to the other piece of our conversation, which is the inequality issue. And bring it down to home in something that we in CWA know so well. And that is that sometimes the dynamism and growth of an industry does not necessarily mean that it's leading to the growth of good jobs. In the 40s, or I think it was in the late 30s, 40s, CW, communication workers working in the Bell System formed CWA. And as the Bell System grew, so did the number of jobs, and because of collective bargaining, so did the quality of the jobs. And so a portion of the productivity was shared with working people. And this was particularly important for women in the industry, because before we had organization, operators that actually made up the majority in the Bell system at that point were not being paid very well. But through collective bargaining, not only was it the skilled craftspeople, the technicians, but especially the women. And this created opportunity for good middle class jobs for women as well. We don't have that situation anymore. As we have promoted a policy of competition in the industry, unfortunately, it has meant in too many cases competition not only based on quality and technology, but competition on who can get the lowest labor costs. And so the new parts of the industry, whether it is cable or with the exception of AT&T, and Dean, offline we can talk about the AT&T T-Mobile merger. <laughs> <laughs> with the exception of AT&T, the wireless industry. And so now, not only do you have global pressure, particularly now that the biggest job, the most numerous jobs in the industry are call center. So you have the global competition for call center. But you have the competition, even within this country, of those jobs that are location specific, whether it's technicians, whether it's retail stores, that there's the downward pressure. Not that the Bell system collectively bargain wages set 
the, the uh, standard. And other companies, even if they're a non-union rate, had to compete. <coughs> but now you have the downward pressure. And so combining the conversation not only about competitiveness and innovation, but also with the conversation that we had on the last panel about institutions that are critical to ensure that it's just not the top 0.001% are absolutely critical to this conversation. Any comments? I, I, I think you're right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the... Uh, I, I, yeah, no, no, I got oh, it. People um, can comment on it. No, it's, you know, it's a good point. I mean, maybe I can make one comment on, on sort of how our networks compare to other countries. I think that's, a, that's something I didn't mention. I'm happy to spend one minute on. Um, this is a tricky analytical problem um, because uh, I always joke that if you were to – like the Netherlands. People always say the Netherlands has great broadband, and they do. And I always say uh, – and I'm from Chicago – that wiring the Netherlands is like wiring northern Illinois. Um, it's flat. Uh, there are no mountains. And there's a lot of people with high incomes. So it's sort of like the easiest broadband problem you could ever get. So the country comparisons are a little spurious. I think the thing that's definitely true is that for a long period of time, we were world-leading. Uh, we are not any longer. Um, you can argue how, whether we're at parity, how far behind we are, whatever, but if, if, if we, if for a long period of our history, we were leading, uh, we're not doing that anymore. And, and that, to me, should be the sense of urgency that I know I felt at the FCC uh, in my time there and that I think the team there still has. Um, and that is a complicated problem on how to get back to be, uh, to be world leading. And if we do that um, through a whole host of things, many in the broadband plan, many outside, things that industry will do, that should be the goal. And I think when you come back to the goals of the broadband plan around, I forget, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, 100 million homes with 100 megabits, whatever the, there's sort of some goals at the beginning. That's where we need to really focus to be, uh, to be world leading. And that means uh, better networks, higher quality networks uh, across the board. And we should, none of us should feel complacent. It's a pretty remarkable thing that we can do right now with these things. But, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we were world leading. Uh, today, not so much. Um, and so we should, you know, we should focus on that. I have a, if I can say one quick thing about this, uh, too. Um, just to make a broader point, which is to say um, that Fred Block has called this sort of pervasive government role um, the hidden development mental state in the U.S., and that um, the state's role does not get out into public discourses, and usually most of our politics are about markets and allowing markets sort of free reign to do this. Um, and it's to say in response to your point that um, we can't go backwards to the Bell Labs and the sort of vertically integrated firms of old, um, but that um, to, just to sort of remind you that innovation is embodied and people and human resources that actually make the discoveries that go in among, among these things. And that um, in order to have a well-trained, uh, sort of well, uh, sort of uh, robust uh, crop of ideas coming from people, you need um, essentially what are high road policies that are investments in education, investments in skill development, um, and that those kinds of investments are what drive forward the cutting edge ideas that have been underpinned our economic growth. Thanks. Yes. A question came up earlier about um, health care costs, and I think um, in relation to this topic, um, another area of inequality is the um, outcome, the, who gets the benefits, financial benefits of the innovations, and what policies would we need to elaborate in to ensure that the profits are more widespread? So we don't get uh, high prices from innovations, let's say, in drugs. So I, I think it has to do with all the other wages, uh, uh, sharing the benefits. I like to see it that right, rather than sharing the inequality, sharing the benefits for more. How do we ensure that without a national public uh, policy? And is that one of the things that our movement, you know, we talk about what is the role of the movement uh, on Wall Street? I mean, and, and unless there's collective bargaining, unless there's the shared, uh, um, maybe we have to be more specific about all these elements. Uh, government is not recognized in the country for these innovations. I'm, 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 I, I think I can better be a, a spokesperson for it now after hearing these, uh, these issues addressed. 
Well, I'll let the panel deal with that, but I will just say something quickly about drugs. I mean, we just, just be really clear. Drugs are expensive because of the government. I mean, government patents. I mean, we spend about $300 billion a year on prescription drugs. If we got rid of patent protection, we'd spend about $30 billion a year. So the cause of the inequality is government there. It's not uh, so. Anyhow, but I'll let other people. I just That's really. Question, yeah. It can be like a friendly amendment. Okay. It's just related, so I can't. <laughs> okay. If it's not, just yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's yeah. great. But basically, one of the charts that you have relates directly to this. Was like 13 of the 15 breakthrough pharmacological or therapeutic, uh, whatever they were, right. got federal support. And then I'm thinking, just like you, 13 of the 50. What do we get for that? That was our investment. What do we get? We got patents for a very long time, which means economic rents on high prices. And once these patents end, then you have competition, more innovation in product design, development, and much cheaper. Just related to what, so a question, again, this is related to what you're saying. Whether they're R&D tax subsidies, whether they're direct grants, whether they're direct uh, creation of like the solar panels, that's, those are investments. And yet, again, it's not an area I necessarily know about. It's not recognized that the public sector is an investor in that. Therefore, they don't, we don't get returns on that. So a question becomes, when you look at innovation policy and look at these investments, and they are investments by the public in these spheres, shouldn't they be treated as investments just like, in quotes, a business does? So there should be some conditions on that, whether they're shared profits related to you or uh, uh, job production or production in the U.S. You talked about some of these processes, one of the, what Kate was talking about, these processes are developed here and stimulated here, yet production goes overseas. These can be all conditions. Uh, collective bargaining that these companies, right, responsible business, whatever. But it's an investment. And as an investor, any business would have conditions on this. Why don't we have conditions on this? Why is it just a free a free ride where we invest and sometimes suffer from it. So if that's a friendly okay. amendment, okay, thanks. <laughs> Matt, do you want us to, or I'll, let me respond really quickly. I think this is a, a particular problem in, in, in the clean energy world. There's a, a number of people who, like Bill Gates, who is a, a huge supporter of innovation in clean energy, but what his take on it is, is we should be doing all this high level innovation and the main purpose should be to bring down costs. So that's what he would say the benefit is, is that the cost of energy is cheaper. But that kind of takes away all these other areas where you need benefit, like that we are doing the manufacturing, that we're creating jobs, that there's innovation, that uh, the, the, the fact that there's U.S. innovation is, as you said, sort of spreading uh, um, throughout the economy. One thing that I've talked to some folks on the Hill about, and I think is an interesting question, is you know, we do still do a fair amount of early stage R&D um, investment from the public sector. Um, companies that do that, a lot of oil and gas companies invest in universities to do uh, research and development in energy. And every time that happens, they, I've seen a lot of these contracts, actually Cap did a big report on Big Oil Goes to College, you can find it on our website, uh, about this. Whenever they do a contract, they say, for instance, that the first right, that they, that they can review anything that goes out to publication from, where, from the scholars that are funded by it, or, and that they get the first right of refusal of all licenses from any innovation that comes out of their technology. Um, we don't do anything like that. When the U.S. government does investment in R&D and clean energy, for instance, we don't have any conditions about where that uh, technology is commercialized. Uh, and I think that's an interesting question. I mean, and I know there's, there's, there's legislation that actually made it harder to have those conditions on, on public investment. But I do think it's, a, it's an important question in the, in the energy space in particular because there's a lot of public sector R&D money still going into this space without a lot of conditions on where uh, where that money gets spent. I think that's probably a better way to deal with it than my concern about things like Buy America on clean energy technology is that if we had Buy America without any of the demand creating policies that make this a, the clean energy sector grow in this country, it's going to be very hard to achieve that. I mean, very hard to sort of scale up your manufacturing when you don't have a lot of demand for the products uh, because you don't have any policy supporting that. So I think that there's other ways to get at that, but, um, but it's a great question. Yeah. 
Yeah, let me. Um, so in the book, uh, one of the things that uh, one of the authors, Fred Block, talks about is having a, is precisely what you say, some sort of gain sharing program in which early investments will be tracked. And I, I wanted to say a couple of this. One of the problems is tracking um, that back in 1995, um, and it was out of a specific scandal that the office, the old Office of Technology Assessment, which was closed down by the Newt Gingrich Congress, um, did a report of um, NIH involvement in new biopharmaceuticals. And I'm going to get the numbers wrong, um, but it was either um, of 24 or 41, I, I don't remember which, was of drugs that had come out of NIH-supported research that the sort of the executives in the NIH were only aware of three of their initial early investments had resulted in sort of large breakthroughs that had, were transformed into actual marketable products that were making a profit. In other words, that they didn't, had, didn't even track, like once the grants went out, you know, what were the concrete results of this. And many programs simply don't have the budget for this kind of tracking. Um, the Small Business Innovation Research Program is one um, that the legislation setting up literally provides no money for administration of the program, and so that each individual agency has to set up its own tracking um, sort of devices for this. Um, and that is sort of the sort of one of the more uh, potent sort of cases out of this is that there was the case of Ceridase and Cerazyme, which is a treatment for Gaucher's disease. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but that the key developments were made by NIH scientists working in federal research facilities. Um, but they were then transformed by a private company who took some of those initial discoveries and transformed it um, into Ceridase and Cerazyme. Um, but then um, that these um, costs of research and development and discovery were essentially socialized. They were coming out of NSF grants. But then um, this is a very small population of people who had this condition. And when the drug went on the marketplace, that they were um, charging up to something like $150,000 per year for the average treatments. In other words, that the cost of discovery had at least in part been socialized, but then the profits were not sort of pulling back into things. So there has to be some mechanism to do that. And that, that's a very complicated discussion, and I'm not sure exactly how you do it. But that there does seem to be sort of a, a lack of payback in some of these cases. And then if I could add something without adding something. So um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go uh, and talk about pharmaceuticals. I heard a great presentation Dean gave uh, earlier this year on the, on the subject. And I'm not going to comment on that because I'll get fired if I do. So, um, But generally speaking, when it comes to federal R&D, um, it's more basic R&D. And a real benefit of federal R&D not going into the marketplace is that this research is done, and then that research is open for use by everybody. That's a real benefit, and that's something. Now, you may have a, an issue with a particular NIH grant that develops a certain drug or something like that. Maybe there's a specific, specific area in the clean energy. But for the large part, this is very basic research, and that's kind of what we want the government to do. If the government starts going into and trying to become a private competitor in the research marketplace, that's fraught with a lot of peril, and we have to be very careful about that path. And I think from the government's point of view is, um, you know, we want society to be better off. And there are many market failures, i.e., there's lots of reasons why the private sector won't do research in certain areas, um, especially at the early stages. And that's where the government, I think, has the, has, has the biggest role. Um, and whenever the government does get into the commercialization aspect directly, I mean, we, we see what happens there. And that's, it might be kind of good policy, but if you have a bad example, then that sets you know, it gives the other side too much ammunition. So I think you have to weigh that in the calculus of making these decisions. This is a really important point. Um, and if you think about the chart that you put up, um, and I've looked at that chart many times about R&D spending being, you know, actually pretty good. Um, and that is true. It's easy to kind of go to sleep at night and say, well, you know, the private sector is kind of stepping up, so the raw numbers are the same. But there's a hidden loss <laughs> in there, which is that, uh, you know, private sector R&D is for shareholders. Um, that's not a bad thing, um, but uh, R&D that's federally funded is different, um, and it has, it's for a different purpose, and it t typically has different side effects. Um, and so I think even when we all look at that chart, we should be excited that the R&D numbers are kind of hanging tough, but we should also be a little nervous that not enough uh, kind of pure basic science is being done that's federally funded, because then that goes lots of places. Um, you know, it's not for the benefit of shareholders. It's for the benefit of everybody. Okay, well, thank you. I think that pretty much gets our time, but thank you. It was a very good discussion. Great panel, and thanks for uh, staying. Thank yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and to our partners at the Communications Workers of America and the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And I just want to echo that Nicole Wu is um, <coughs> our 
keystone here in terms of making this event happen. And I think we hit our mark on food for thought. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll take you back at